Hey everyone, I'm Jerry Saffron. This is Kitco News. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button for the latest. Well, today's economic data is giving us a lot to think about. Retail sales surged by 1% in July, marking the strongest increase since early 2023. Now, car sales snap back after a rough June, and while this headline number looks promising, when you peel back the layers and exclude autos and gasoline, the gains are much more modest at 0.4%. Meanwhile, initial unemployment claims fell to 227,000, their lowest level since early July, signaling a potential resilient labor market. But with core CPI still sitting at 3.2% and shelter costs continuing to rise, rent included, and the big question is whether these numbers are telling the whole story. And we've got a fantastic guest today, Stephanie Pomboy from Macro Mavens, who's been sounding the alarm on these very issues. Now, she's questioning whether the apparent strength in the consumer spending and the labor market is just a facade and what it could mean for the Fed's next move. Stephanie, great to have you on Kitco. Thanks for joining us. It's such a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. I'm excited to make my debut here. On the debut. Oh, the debut. Well, I mean, you certainly have touched base on this. I went through two of your reports yesterday. And before we kind of get into them a little bit, and I love the names, we'll get into that. Uh, let's talk to you a little bit about this data. T talk to me about what you're seeing. Would any of this data surprise you on the jobs front? Well, you know, what's really interesting to me, Jeremy, is how the markets, um, they're very flexible in terms of what they want to focus on. I'll put it that way. Um, so normally they would sort of underweight the statistics that are produced by these various government agencies and focus more on what they're hearing from companies. But today is a perfect example of that flexibility wherein Walmart came out with uh, better earnings than expected because they're uh, broadening their customer base to incorporate people who used to be able to afford it, uh, Whole Foods, who are now buying groceries at Walmart. So that's a negative sign about the consumer. Um, but it was completely drowned out by this retail sales number, which you so beautifully articulated, um, was not nearly as good underneath as it appeared on the surface. Uh, and they did revise down last month. This seems to be the the pattern here. You know, you come in, you surprise on the upside with whatever the number is, payroll, employment, retail sales, uh, yada, yada. Um, and then quietly uh, in the next month, you revise the, the data lower. Um, today, for example, we got industrial production, uh, which disappointed, but they also revised lower the month prior, which was the 13th out of 18 months that they've lowered the, you know, their, their initial revision. So anyway, that's, yeah. it's, it's interesting. I mean, you almost got to take the data with a grain of salt. I mean, we talked about that retail sale number. It looks strong at the first glance. When you dig deeper, that 1% gain is heavily skewed by, skewed by, you know, the rebound in auto sales. I know we had that, that hack last week too, but you know, when we get autos, gasoline out, we're only looking at that 4%, 0.4% increase and I'm, I'm kind of curious because given that you've been saying about consumers increasingly relying on credit and facing higher interest rates, you know, do you think this spending is sustainable or are we seeing a temporary boost masking, you know, bigger fragility here? Yeah, well, I, I obviously, as you said, have been underscoring the weakness in the consumer for a long time. And one thing that's important to note about these retail sales figures is are not adjusted for inflation um, in real terms. Yeah, retail sales actually peaked in in sorry in March of 2021. So they've been declining basically for three years now. Um, and on the credit card front, obviously we saw this period where, you know, not to go too far back in history, but when we came out of the pandemic and we had all this surplus stimulus that was still in the pipeline, consumers used that money to pay down credit card balances very smartly. Um, and then as soon as the check stopped coming and, the, and they ran out of money, uh, the credit card borrowing started to pick up and it really coincided with the ramp higher in inflation, not coincidentally. And that was a real warning sign that people weren't being able to keep up with the price of everything they couldn't live without. So they were running up credit card balances just to stay afloat. Um, and they were doing that at 23 percent interest rates, mind you. Um, but we've now seen, and I like to describe this as signs that the consumer is both spent up and lent up because um, in two of the last three months, consumers have not increased credit card borrowing. We actually saw modest declines in their credit card borrowing. So they're just tapped out at this point. They're saying, and you see the delinquency rates, you know, it's no wonder if you're way behind on your credit card debt, 
um, you're not inclined to run up the balance even further. So you're really seeing that stress. Um, the delinquency rates are probably the best indicator of it. And then what you're hearing from companies across the board, you know, they're really warning about this clear slowdown in the consumer. Wayfair, I thought was interesting, you know, ultimate discretionary um, com spending company. They likened the slowdown they were seeing in the consumer to what they saw during the depths of the global financial crisis. You know, and think about that. We're at 4.3% on the unemployment rate. It, you know, in 2009, we were at 10. So this is a really uh, inauspicious harbinger of, of what's to come. Yeah, I mean, you talk about the revisions of the data, and it seems like it comes very fast. Are we heading towards a point where the debt becomes unmanageable? And then, of course, potentially leading to a sharp contraction in spending. Is this something we're just going to see months down the line? Yeah, I mean, I think you are starting to see it, notwithstanding this morning's uh, retail sales report. But again, going back to companies, and just to underscore the point, fact set um, reports that you know consumer discretionary earnings are up 11.9% this quarter year on year. If you take out Amazon, which I'm not a stock analyst, but I believe they make all their money in AWS, not in the doodads and stuff that I'm buying on the online you know, retail site, um, the consumer discretionary earnings go from up 11.9 to minus 3.5. So the recession is here. It's just being masked by a handful of companies. And it's sort of that same mag seven story that's you know, it's skewing the indices, both in terms of price performance and in terms of earnings growth. And I think that latter part is less uh, widely appreciated that the earnings story isn't broad based at all. It's just as concentrated as the price performance is. Yeah. You know, 70. Uh, OK, well, today's initial unemployment claims, you know, they dropped to their lowest level since early July. And some are suggesting this is good. You know, they're holding steady. But you've raised concerns about the quality of jobs and the wage growth, not keeping up with the pace of inflation. To, to talk to me about how it really is out there. I mean, you know, we go through this data. What's really happening? Yeah, you know, well, again, you have to kind of look through the government statistics. It, you know, here we've seen uh, until this last month, uh, any number of stronger than expected payroll reports that then get revised lower. And then we've also seen this massive gap between the payroll survey and the household survey. Uh, and the household survey has always tended to be more reliable at turning points in the economy. And we could get into the weeds as to why that is, but there's some statistical rationale for that. Um, but what's really important to me on the employment front is you've seen um, what companies did, I think, after COVID was they had so much trouble getting people back to work, you know, struggling to get people who are getting money from the government off the sofa and back, you know, on the job. And so once they finally reached full staffing, their inclination to cut heads as they saw things slowing was very low. They probably figured, look, why don't we just slash their hours while we wait to see if this is a real slowdown or just a temporary, you know, soft patch? And so what we've seen is hours have been chopped and chopped and chopped to the point that um, people have had to take on second and third jobs. So you've had this huge increase in multiple job holders at the same time that full employment is actually declining year on year. And that has always been a recession signal. So the full employment um, component is telling you we're in recession already, notwithstanding you know these weekly jobless claims, which... Are, have their own sort of issues around them. Um, Bloomberg did a really excellent study months and months ago that highlighted that it, a very large portion of people who are eligible for unemployment aren't taking it. Uh, and my speculation for that is that, you know, the state and local governments got so much money from the federal government from the COVID stimulus that they implemented all these special assistance programs and, you know, they were sending out rebates and all kinds of supports that maybe made it such that people didn't have to take unemployment. Maybe they were getting more generous benefits from their state and local various um, options. So we'll see. It's, it's interesting. You know, when we start to look at it, too, and we kind of pull it down, I mean, you recently highlighted the Philly Fed report, and there's always this this mainstream and, you know, Main Street and Wall Street, there's such a disconnect. I mean, we talk about what inflation is doing. And then when I hear from viewers, you know, people are really strapped. We go back to that Philly Fed report, uh, which showed a significant drop in activity, rising input costs, sharp decline in hiring. 
How do you put these regional concerns together with this, you know, alleged positive national data that we're seeing here? Yeah, I mean, it's the, the perils of uh, describing everything with one brush. You know, it's sort of like the consumer where we look at these average statistics because we have no choice, but there's really no one represented by the average. You've got the high end and the low end and their experiences are markedly different. The same is true in the corporate space, I might add. I mean, you've, you have a very small segment of companies that are driving the earnings growth um, and the rest of them are really struggling, as I mentioned, with that consumer discretionary earnings you know, difference between Amazon and with and without Amazon. Um, but what you're seeing on the um, corporate front is not only an issue of them dealing with the same pricing pressures that the consumer is dealing with, especially with the increased regulatory burden they've had in the last several years, um, plus the higher energy costs, et cetera. Um, but they're also dealing with massive uncertainty now. Uh, the NFIB small business survey came out earlier in the week and didn't get a whole lot of attention. Within that, they ask, they have an uncertainty component. That uncertainty component on a scale of zero to 100, went to 90. I mean, that's about as uncertain as they get. And in fact, you know, when you go back and look at that and overlay it, not surprisingly, with capital spending, you can't really distinguish the two lines. They look exactly the same. So when your uncertainty is high, your inclination to uh, pursue CapEx and higher, by the way, um, is obviously greatly restrained. So I think that's part of what's happening here is the election and the uncertainty around what the policy framework is going to be is another dampening um, factor on the, uh, corporate and, and business activity. Yeah. And you you talked about it. I mean, there's such a divide when it comes to the MAG-7, what their revenues projections are, even some of their quarterly numbers. And then looking at small businesses, which is the backbone of America. So, I mean, you know, when we compare the two, how stark are the differences here? Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely staggering. And I, I like to look at uh, the government in the GDP accounts, they report profits, and those profits are reported for the entire country, all companies, not just the 500 S&P companies that Wall Street fixates on, and the gap between the earnings growth reported by the S&P and the broader economy uh, really tells you the story. Um, although I did, it, it, just to underscore the point, to see an analysis that was, I think, JP Morgan did, and they said, of the Russell small cap companies, 40% are unprofitable, 40%. 17% of mid caps are unprofitable and 7% of S&P 500 companies are unprofitable. So again, there's a lot more pain beneath the surface that just is kind of masked by these MAG-7 and the other you know, stocks that are really responsible for driving the, the indices higher. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked a little bit about the businesses there. We, we also got to talk about the consumers. I mean, you know, we talked about this reliance on credit card debt. Could this lead to a situation where consumers' defaults rise really sharply? And then, you know, all this work that the Fed's done, it triggers a more severe economic downturn than we're currently expecting. I mean, how close are we at a tipping point here? Well, I mean, I've actually been surprised that it's taken this long, to be honest, um, but I think a lot of that had to do with the overwhelming fiscal stimulus and the time it took for that to kind of flow out of the system. Um, I, you know, one thing, and this is kind of uh, uh, just a theory that I've been keeping an eye on, Jeremy, and I'll share it with you and see if, it, you know, it uh, generates any interest. But, um, you know, we've had this whole student loan attempt to forgive student loan debt. Um, and despite the, it, continually being rejected by the courts, you know, the administration keeps pushing it and they're insisting and they're going around the back door and trying to do that. And I, what I worry about with that is that it might be sowing the seeds of sort of a moral hazard on Main Street, as I like to call it, where people who have run up all these credit card balances just struggling to maintain their basic existence might say, hey, why is the administration bailing out my neighbor whose kids went to some fancy Ivy League college and ran out of debt? And I have to pay 23% on this credit card that just so I can fill up my car and put groceries on the table. Um, you know, if we get into an environment where people start to sort of go on strike and not pay their bills, I'm not sure if that's what's happening in terms of the spike of the delinquency rate in credit cards and auto loans. But 
were that to happen, it would argue for a more severe delinquency cycle than we've seen in prior um, downturns. So it's something I'm definitely keeping an eye on. And I think it's a real possibility because you've created this psychology, this mentality out there that, you know, you're not really responsible for your debts because the government's going to come and bail you out. Yeah. It almost seems like COVID did a lot of that for the economic data that we're seeing now. I mean, what was before is no longer the case. Uh, okay, I have to ask you about the rate cuts. I mean, obviously, we're seeing the markets do quite well today. They're, they're anticipating some positive news here. But we've also seen, you know, this 50 basis point cut maybe be taken off the table. Uh, Bostic on the rate Tuesday, be pre-CPI, he said, quote, I want to see a little more data. Bostic Post CPI to Financial Times said, I'm open to something happening in September. Where are we? Well, I always thought this idea of an immaculate pivot, which is how I like to describe it, was completely ridiculous. The idea that the Fed was going to somehow cut rates in advance of the economy or the markets um, coming unglued just belied history. You know, the Federal Reserve is always late, uh, they always get it wrong. And so I've just been betting on the status quo, you know, and and uh, so far that bet seems to be uh, playing out, we'll see. But I thought this idea that they were gonna cut aggressively just didn't square with the going market narrative. I mean, if you think we're having a soft landing, um, the inflation numbers, albeit coming down, are still above the Fed's target. We've got unemployment, Four three, not exactly, you know, indicative of a really dis- debilitated labor market. So, what's the rationale for the Fed to be rushing in and cutting rates, other than to rescue, uh, you know, uh, Wall Street, which uh, shouldn't be their job? So, um, I'm highly skeptical, but I do think we'll get a lot of rate cuts because it'll become clear, as it did that Friday of payroll employment. Um, that they are behind the curve and that, um, you know, numbers like retail sales this morning notwithstanding, the overwhelming weight of evidence suggests that uh, the average consumer is in recession already. Yeah. And I mean, as we look forward to, to 2025, obviously we have elections before that, a lot coming. You talk about these rate cuts. Do you think the Fed's actions now could exasperate, you know, some of the underlying issues we've been discussing? I mean, could we be setting ourselves up for more significant economic challenges next year? Or is this the right step? Well, I think we've already kind of exacerbated it by uh, putting out the idea that, yeah, we're we're inclined to cut and we're going to cut and we're going to try to engineer this perfect soft landing um, because what it's done is really um, sort of bolster risk appetite. And you've seen just money being flung at companies that have no business getting credit out there. So they're really st- extending them a lifeline on the idea that rates are going to be lower in just a few months now. So we'll just throw you a bone for now, just so you can get from here to the pivot, um, even though you can't really pay your bills as it is. So <laughs> this is a really dangerous scenario. Sometimes I feel like they don't think we're going to dive in as journalists into the data too. It's like, what's going on? Uh, okay, I have to ask you before I let you go here, uh, in terms of portfolios right now, I mean, are you going more defensive? Are you looking at healthcare, different things that kind of mitigate this risk? Where, what are you looking at? Well, I mean, I'm so defensive, Jeremy, that my positions are cash and gold. That's how defensive I am. So, and those have been my positions for a long time because, as I said, you know, I've been highly skeptical of this idea that the Fed was going to get it right. And I have been anticipating that we would see the markets really come unglued as it looked like they were starting to do last Friday. Um, and you get into this risk off, um, you know, frenzy, in which case everything would probably get hit as exposures were reduced. And we haven't gotten into the end carry trade, but that's a compounding factor of having to deleverage everything. Um, and, uh, you know, when the dust settles, then you can start getting more um, opportunistic. But right now, I'm just very comfortable sitting on the sidelines, getting, you know, four and a half, five percent sitting in cash and holding gold and waiting to see what's going to happen, especially with the geopolitical risks and the political, you know, uncertainty here um, going up into November. I mean, there's just so much that uh, I have no interest in making aggressive bets in front of. (laughs) Yeah, no, I hear you. And T-bills at 5%, not the worst thing too. Uh, Okay, we appreciate this. There's so many things we could have talked about, Stephanie. We'll have you on again to discuss gold. We'll have you on to discuss the dollar. 
But in the meantime, thank you for taking the time. Stephanie Pomboy from Macro Mavens joining us from New York to break it all down. Thanks again. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. I'm Jeremy Saffin for all of us here at Kitco. Thank you for watching. Plenty of great content coming your way. So stay tuned and we'll see you next time.